Hello and welcome to the July 2017 installment of the Deep Carbon Observatories webinar Wednesdays. This series of webinars is brought to you jointly by Synthesis Group 2019 from the DCO engagement team. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of the engagement team. My engagement colleagues and I collaborate with Synthesis Group 2019 to bring the scientific results DCO has made over a decade together and also help share DCO's scientific findings and discoveries with the scientific community, the media and the public. Today's webinar is the third of a five-part series that will provide viewers with data science modeling and visualization tools to help you better organize and present your data. And it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Mark Giosso. Mark is a geochemist who uses computational thermodynamics to address critical questions in high temperature geochemistry and petrology. Today, Mark is going to lead you through the capabilities of the Enki portal, a collaborative web-based model configuration and testing portal that provides tools in computational thermodynamics and fluid dynamics. He's going to show you how these tools can be used for modeling deep earth fluids, chemical reactions, and transport. Before we start, a few housekeeping bits. If you have questions, please post them in the chat room. We will try our best to answer them. Um, and please keep your microphone muted to avoid feedback during the webinar. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mark. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, talk to you today about the, the Enki project. The Enki project is an NSF funded project uh, that is, uh, has PIs that consist of DCO uh, related activities. So I'm a PI of the Enki project, and uh, so is Peter Fox, and so is Everett Schock, and Dmitry Shervinsky, and uh, George Brigantz, and Mark Spiegelman. Uh, Enki is um, a modeling project. It's funded by the Computer Science Division of the National Science Foundation with support from DCO. And its aim is to try to uh, synthesize various modeling tools that are used in the DCO and to uh, make them, um, uh, to cast them in a way so that the modeling tools can be updated and documented and used in a very, very natural fashion. And let me just start off by um, just summarizing some of these modeling tools that we, we use in the DCO. Here's a, uh, the, the very, very famous now a diagram that Craig Manning published in 2014 in Nature Geoscience, uh, summarizing the way in which carbon is transported in the upper mantle. And what I wanted to do is use this as a backdrop to talk about some of the modeling tools that we commonly use in, in trying to understand the transport of carbon in these systems. Uh, one of them that you, you may have heard about is MELTS. And MELTS is a thermodynamic modeling tool that's used to uh, calculate the distribution of elements arising from melting of the Earth. So we might, for example, want to use MELTS to talk about the transport of carbon in the production of magmas in mid-ocean ridges. Or we might want to use uh, combination of melts and the deep earth water model to, to try to understand and discuss the transport of carbon and the melting of the deeper mantle. Or we might want to use melts and its associated uh, tools to try to understand arc melting or the generation of magmas in the, in the arc volcano environment. Uh, there are other sorts of modeling tools that we use. Aspect, for example, is a fluid dynamical modeling tool that's used to try to understand convection and transport, bulk transport of material uh, in, the, uh, in the mantle. Or we might want to use a purple X or thermal calc, uh, which is used in trying to understand uh, phase equilibria in the subducting slab. And in particular, we might want to combine that with EQ6 and the deep earth water model to try to understand the transport of fluids off the slab. There are other kinds of modeling tools. We can use EQ6 and Helgeson Kirkham Flowers equations, for example, to try to understand fluid transport in the crust. And um, then uh, we might want to combine the whole process of the transport of fluids of various kinds to try to look at reaction of behavior be during the transport of fluids through the, upper, through the upper mantle and upper crust. All these tools are used by uh, EPC and reservoirs and fluxes and re really actually the entire DCO community. And one of the 
aims of Enki is to try to understand how these tools interact with each other, how to uh, uh, maintain them, how to make them more responsive to the kind of scientific questions that we're interested in trying to answer. And therein lies a problem, because if we take these tools and we just sort of lay them out like this, we have to ask ourselves, can these tools speak to each other? Is there a way in which the results of a MELTS calculation can, be, can interact with the modeling in EQ3 or EQ6? Can the results of the MELTS calculation feed into purple X? Can they feed into thermal calc? How do we combine the fluid dynamics calculations of aspect and terra firma with the computational thermodynamics calculations of MELTS and EQ6? Well, the answer right now is that we can't. And this is a problem. It's a very serious problem. Because if we really are interested in the DCO modeling effort of trying to integrate all these tools to say something about the transport of carbon in the Earth, right now we're at a loss because these software tools don't talk to each other. And it's even worse than that. The problem is, is that most of these software tools are built using thermodynamic databases which are internally inconsistent with each other. For example, the MELTS model is built on its own thermodynamic database. The EQ3 and EQ6 and SUPGRID models are built on alternative databases, which are for the most part incompatible with that in MELTS. ThermoCalc is an entirely different database, which is completely independent of that. And, um, the uh, fluid dynamics calculations or the purple or the perplex calculations, for example, are, are based on thermodynamic databases of whatever you want. In, in the case of the fluid dynamics calculations, usually you choose something that works really, really fast computationally. In the case of purple X, you mix and match thermodynamic databases, and that's always a danger because when you mix and match databases that are not internally consistent with each other, you don't necessarily get results that are especially useful. So how can we fix this? Well, the thing that we need to fix this is we need some sort of infrastructure to maintain the underlying thermodynamic data models and to maintain the apps that perform the calculations that these data models embody. The problem is there is no such software. All of the underlying data that were used to calibrate these thermodynamic models is not available in electronic form. It has been put together and, and, and assembled in the past, used to construct the models, and then those underlying data sources were simply discarded. Or they're on media which are currently not available, or they're simply not shared with the community. What's even worse is that there's no integrated modeling and visualization infrastructure to take the results of all these models and put them together and actually generate something which is comprehensive and cross model. So, and, and that's, that's difficult because it's, it's time consuming then to do one model calculation, try to feed it into another, try to visualize the results of one and the other and put them all together into something which is useful. And the problem with all this is that you generally have hordes of people that want to use, hordes of users, right? You guys who want to actually use these, these tools and um, you just can't because there's no easy way to do it. Or even if you try to do it, it requires so much effort that it's really questionable whether it's worth the time and energy to actually do the integration. Enki is trying to fix this. Enki's trying to fix this by taking these common models and others, not just the ones listed here, and trying to assemble them in a way so that the underlying models become not the focus of the effort, but rather the underlying models become part of a more generalized effort that allows a standard user interface to be used to access all of these modeling tools. And more importantly, it allows for a standard set of software libraries to be developed that actually implement those models and implement those databases, but allow for a very, very simple and easy way to combine the results. The modeling interface that we've chosen to use for Enki is Jupyter Notebooks. And I know that one of the previous webinars in this series 
had been what that was given by the, the RPI group focused on the use of Jupyter notebooks and Jupyter data analysis tools to try to understand how, uh, how data can be manipulated and visualized and used. We've chosen to use Jupyter as part of the Enki project to visualize and combine the results of these models. Now, importantly to the Enki project, what we've also decided to do is to build an underlying model calibration updating and documentation infrastructure that supports these libraries and supports these models. And one of the things that's, that's necessary in order to implement this model calibration documentation infrastructure is to actually go back to the literature and generate online data resources that constitute the very data upon which all of these models are calibrated. So this will be the first time that these general data resources will be available to the entire community for use in this uh, model calibration, model development, and model use uh, infrastructure. And hopefully, or what we're hoping is that when Enki is done, we're about a, a year into a three-year project here, we're hoping that when Enki is done, we're gonna have lots and lots of happy and satisfied users to have access to all of these underlying tools through a standardized interface. And more importantly, if they have a new information, new experimental data, new insights uh, to bring to the modeling uh, infrastructure, there will be software tools available for them to bring those insights and data into the model, update the models and maintain them and publish them and so on and so forth. So that's the overall structure of Enki. Um, so the modeling deficiencies that Enki tries to address are the lack of interoperability of existing modeling software, the lack of an infrastructure and data resources to update models, and this is very important, the lack of frameworks for accessing and distributing the models. I mean, once you produce a model, how do you actually get it available to the community? Do you distribute software? If so, does that software run on every platform a user might want to use? Um, will the software go out of date? Will the platform go out of date? Will the language go out of date? Enki tries to, to cut through all of that by making all of this software available through a standard web browser using Jupyter Notebooks and you just access it. It doesn't matter what machine you're running, the calculations are actually done on a server somewhere else and you don't have to worry about it. And the other thing that, that Enki is trying to address is this idea of reproducible workflows. When you develop a model, it is very difficult to actually document exactly how you develop a model. Oh yes, you publish it. But publishing a model, when, when you publish something, and I can give you a little dirty secret here, when you publish something, you never actually record exactly the way you did it. But with the Enki project, we will be able to record exactly how models were developed so that someone can go back and see and work through the exact actual workflow and thought process involved in model development. And that's going to be important for the future, for the next generation of people that want to build on models. What science workflows does it address? Well, one of the things that we notice in geochemistry and petrology and any kind of modeling effort is that there really is an excessive use of apps. And what I mean by apps are, are tools that do one and only one thing. Now they may do a, a, a fairly sophisticated thing like melts or, or do or EQ6 or aspect or terra firma. They may do a sophisticated thing, but you're constrained by the kinds of input that's allowed by the app. And nowhere is this more abundant than in the excessive use of Excel in geochemistry and petrology, where yes, Excel is very flexible, but also yes, Excel only allows you to do certain kinds of calculations, make certain kinds of plots, and do certain kinds of integration between various software. It's hard, for example, to stick melts and terra firma into an Excel context and get them to work together. So, Enki is trying to produce a user interface which is easy to use, which, which allows users to move away from the simple app and from the simple use of Excel for all of these geochemical and petrological problems. Um, one of the important things that Enki is trying to do is standardize the application programming interface or the API for software libraries. 
so that every thermodynamic database is accessed in exactly the same way with the same kind of interface, interface. So that if you want to make a diagram of a certain kind, there's a standard way in which to do it, no matter what thermodynamic database you're using. There's a standard way of integrating, for example, computational thermodynamics results and computational fluid dynamic results, and so on and so forth. The other science paradigm that Enki is trying to address is this notion of coding. Most scientists nowadays try to avoid writing computer programs. And that's fine as long as somebody has provided you with a computer program to do exactly what you want to do. But suppose you want to do something slightly different. Well, some people will say, oh, I don't know how to do it, so I'm just not going to program it up, so I won't pursue that avenue of research. <clears throat> and that's silly. If you have an underlying software library like Enki, that provides tools for all of the hard aspects of the calculation you're trying to do, it's a pretty simple matter to just put the bits and pieces together using some very, very simple programming techniques. And that, again, is why we've chosen Jupyter Notebooks and why we've chosen Python as the primary language. So what science outcomes are we interested in in the, in the Enki project? And, um, one of the main things that we're interested in doing is trying to encourage synthesis science by putting all these various models together and being able to do so in a convenient and sort of natural way. We can get users and we can get the scientific community to actually try to address problems that would otherwise be very difficult to do. And in the context of synthesis science, the Yankee Project is also very good at trying to provide resources for learning um, based upon research grade models. There's no, there's no reason to simplify the underlying models and the underlying explanations if you have access to them so you can use them in teaching and you can use them in, in other the classroom activities, self-learning activities, and so on and so forth. So presently, uh, we're about one year into the Enki project, and I, I would like to sort of review now what is currently available in Enki and show you a few examples of that. Right now, we have available in the context of the Enki project all of the MELTS models and underlying solution theory and thermodynamic databases and so on and so forth. We have the Berman 1988 thermodynamic database. We have the high pressure, a high temperature, thermodynamic database of Stixrud and Lithgow and Bertoloni. We have the Helgeson, Kirkham and Flowers equations and do readily available now in Enki. We have the Holland and Powell standard state solution models and we are just beginning to work on the specialized thermodynamic models of Jacobs and, and others. And to give you an idea of what this means, I thought I would show you three examples of um, the sorts of calculations that, be, that can be done right now using the Enki interface. And, and I know if some of you are anxious and, and want to try to do some of these calculations yourself, I'll show you at the very, very end of this webinar exactly how to get access to the Enki compute server, get access to these Jupyter notebooks and do some of these calculations yourself. So here's a simple example. My first example is a simple a Jupyter notebook that shows you access to the underlying thermodynamic databases and, and, uh, and data model collections. And I thought I would just show a simple example of, of three of the um, important thermodynamic databases that are used, the Berman database, the Stixrud database, the Holland and Powell database, and show you how easy it is to actually work with these in the Yankee context. What you're looking at here is a is a screenshot of a Jupyter Notebook. And Jupyter Notebook consists of uh, lines of text that, uh, that, that serve as description of what the software is doing, and then lines of Python code that can actually be executed that actually do the calculation of interest. So the first line of Python, or the first little block of Python code here, simply reads in some of the important software libraries that are used in trying to do these calculations with Enki. The second line of Python code, you can tell it's a, it's a block of Python code by the IN space bracket uh, designation. The second block of Python code is just instantiating the entire database of Berman, Stixrud, and Holland and Powell. 
And the third little block of Python code says, give me the thermodynamic properties of quartz in each one of those databases. So now what can we do with them? Well, with a simple little block of Python code, what I'm showing here is we can read in some data that we have stored on disk. In this case, it's data that actually consists of measurements of the heat capacity of quartz. And then in a few simple lines of Python code, we can actually create model values of the heat capacity of quartz according to Berman, according to Stick's root, and according to Holland and Powell. And then with a couple of more lines of Python code, we can plot up all the results and the plot is shown. And one of the interesting things that you can see is that the data, which are shown by the green circles, correspond to the output of the thermodynamic database of Holland and Powell and Berman in a very, very natural way, but do not correspond to the thermodynamic properties calculated from Stix Root and Lithgow Bertoloni. Well, that's not necessarily bad. That just means that the database of Stix Root and Lithgow Bertoloni is not applicable to the heat capacity of quartz under these low pressure, low temperature conditions. And that was known before, but this is a really nice way to visualize it. But the point of this example is that thermodynamic properties can be easily calculated and compared using the current Enki structure. And that little red box on the side that says options, those give you an idea of all the thermodynamic properties that can be uh, calculated on the fly at any point in time just by instantiating Enki in uh, instantiating one of the uh, thermodynamic databases within Enki. Second example just to give you an idea of a more sophisticated kind of calculation. Here's a Jupyter notebook that enables computation of simple phase diagrams. This is something that petrologists and geochemists do all the time. The metamorphic petrologists, in fact, tend to make a living out of this, making pseudo-section phase diagrams. Well, how do you do this in Enki? Again, you instantiate the thermodynamic database, you decide what phases you would like to involve in the reaction, in this case, the three phases involved in the reactions are aluminosilicate phases. They're andalusite, kyanite, and silimonite. If you don't know what those are, those are just mineral phases that uh, are all the same composition, Al2SiO5. And in terms of the Enki calculation, to do something like find the point where all three of those phases coexist, it's a simple single call. Calculate the triple point and that tells you where all three of those phases exist. Or to simply plot them up in a phase diagram, it's a simple thing of calling a single line of code in Python that finds the reaction boundaries and pressure temperature space. And then since we are visual people, we want to plot them. And so there's a very, very simple way of plotting them. This phase diagram involving these three minerals and, and essentially this pseudo section for this bulk composition took less than the amount of, well, it took the amount of time it takes me to press the return key in this Jupyter notebook cell. So they're a very fast calculation. We really can just say, I want to look at a phase diagram. Let's see what the phase diagram looks like. And it's, the response is that fast. In, in the Anki project, our motto is that we want to create software that's easy to use and fast so that we can model at the speed of thought. And the calculation of these phase diagrams can really be done that fast now. And so you can sort of think through it. What does a phase diagram look like? Suppose I add this mineral. Suppose I add that mineral. What does it do to the phase diagram? That can be done now in the Jupyter Notebook, in the browser, without you having to, to install any software whatsoever, just looking, just pointing at the Anki server. And finally, one calculation involving uh, melts. And, and the, what I'm gonna say here can be, can be applicable to melts or the deep earth water model. It really doesn't matter. Both of these are equilibrium calculators. Both of these take collections of thermodynamic data and ask what is the equilibrium phase assemblage. Melts does this for magmas. Uh, you may or may not know that there are various, various versions of melts, but all of them are available within the context of these Jupyter notebooks. And uh, what you do is you simply, you simply import the Enki libraries again. You simply say, create an instance, last line there, create an instance of uh, melts, and then uh, do some calculations. So specify some 
uh, bulk composition, some temperature and pressure, hit the return, calculate the phase assemblage. And then it is very easy. I haven't showed the code here, but it's very, very easy to set up a sequence of calculations, gather the output, and simply plot it up. And again, that entire diagram there, which shows the results of melt calculations for the crystallization of rhyolite starting at 760 degrees, going all the way down to 740 degrees, that was done in about two seconds of time, um, calling melts repeatedly in this, uh, in this uh, user interface. And the results are plotted up. And not only are the results plotted up, and you can plot any results you wish, actually, but not only are the results plotted up, but they are output to a standard Excel file. Because I realize that no matter how much I rail against the use of Excel, people like Excel, and they want their output to appear in Excel so that they could work with it. So those are three examples of what you can currently do with the um, Enki project infrastructure. But there are many, many more that are coming. And most importantly, the, the aspects of Enki that are still under development and, and will, I think, be, be most important uh, is this ability to do model calibration, updating, and documentation. So uh, Enki will provide a central platform for access to models and data. And uh, it, can, of course, consists of these standardized APIs and uh, standard user interfaces for accessing the underlying databases. But, but importantly, it's going to be building model connections and complex model scenarios and, and, and documenting them. This notion of being able to document how models are calibrated to calibrate them and then to use them in the context of this interface is really important. But not only that, the ability to build these models and then uh, preserve them and allow other people to use them and to affect publish them, to attach a DOI to them so that others can come back and use these, these models that you've developed in this context without your having to go through this complex uh, exercise of trying to distribute software and maintain it and so on and so forth. Um, that's a really important aspect of Enki. And, and it's, it's important in the context of the ability, the ability to update these models is something that very few people can do at the moment. We want to make that, we want to democratize that process to the point where anybody can update these models because the tools and the underlying data resources to do so will be available to virtually anyone. So I want to end with uh, just a slide that shows you, uh, tells you a little bit about some of the Enki resources that are available on the web. Uh, one of the most important sites to look at first, if you're interested in Enki, is the Enki portal website. Um, the Enki portal is a, is a generalized portal that tells you a little bit about the people participating in the Enki project, some of the work groups that we've, we've established to help us develop the Enki user interface and Enki capabilities. And there's also announcements about um, upcoming Enki events and uh, uh, resources that we were making available as part of the Enki project. If anyone is uh, interested in getting access to the Enki server uh, to try out some of these calculations or see how these Jupyter Notebook works, uh, notebooks work or, or just to to fool around a bit with the Enki user interface and maybe you'll find some bugs for us which would be great. Uh, if you're interested in access to the Enki server it's not in a public uh, but it is available to anyone so just send me an email uh, with your name and uh, email address and uh, I can set you up an account and you can try it yourself. And uh, finally, all the uh, source code, all of the, the software that's being developed as part of Enki is open source. And it is available in a, at a code repository called GitLab. So if you're interested in documentation for how the software uh, works, what sort of capabilities there are, or if you're interested in cloning uh, the code itself, um, the address is uh, gitlab.com Enki portal. And again, there are certain uh, uh, repositories, there are certain code repositories that are completely public on this portal already, the underlying melts code, for example. But then there are certain code repositories that we're currently working on that are under development that require uh, permission for access. 
but I'm perfectly happy to, um, to register any uh, new user uh, for access to this software. Um, and if you'd like to have access to the underlying Enki software at this stage, prior to complete public release, uh, just again, email me your account, make an account on GitLab and email me that account name and I will add you to the uh, Enki user group. And finally, um, the, this is not completely official yet, but, but there's a strong rumor that there's going to be a, an extreme physics and chemistry DCO science workshop uh, and science meeting in November, probably in um, uh, Tempe, Arizona at Arizona State University. And associated with that EPC science meeting, there's going to be a data workshop for uh, data entry into the underlying databases that support the Enki infrastructure. We're going to follow that um, EPC data workshop with an Enki literature data entry hackathon. And we would just be delighted if anybody wanted to come and help us enter data, literature data, into the underlying databases that support this thermodynamic model development. So again, if you're interested in that, don't hesitate to send me an email. I want to thank you very much, and I hope that you've uh, enjoyed this sort of brief tour of where Enki is going. And hey Mark, what the thank you very much. That was great. And I'm sure that the entire DCO community is looking forward to modeling at the speed of thought. You know, that's, that's worthy of Coca-Cola <laughs> branding. That's great. Um, we have two, go ahead. <laughs> No, 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 I, I was going to say, I, that, that may seem a little funny, but we're deadly serious about that. If you, can't, if you can't model as fast as you're thinking about a problem, you can't really think through a problem, right? If you have to wait for results, then <laughs> your mind wanders, and you're off somewhere else, and you can't sort of, yeah, and you can't sort of do, because I mean, after all, right, research is all about trying to do things that no one has done before, and there's a natural conservative reluctance to do that. The mind doesn't want to do that. But if there's no impediments to getting the result of a model, then you can just freely think through a problem. And that I think is really, really important. And that is, it's wonderful. That is one of the really central is. goals. Of um, I, we have two, three comments here, over here. And I know you can't see the screen, so I will read them for you. And please, anyone else that has a question for Mark, um, I will do the reading for him. First, um, there's a, a comment from Rob Pocolini who says, great honest comment about models and remembering everything that went into the model. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's really true. And, and I'm guilty as anybody else. I've spent my entire career publishing models and I do my best to try to describe exactly how it was done. And I'll be honest, I go back to a paper from 20 years ago and I can't figure <laughs> out what I did. And that's, right, that's terrible. So we need to fix that. Yeah, and, and that addresses the entire issue of reproducible science, which is a central theme of, of the Sloan Foundation, of all Sloan Foundation projects, a central theme of the DCO. And we need to make sure that that we make well this is a huge step forward and the next one is for me as you add more databases to enki how will people learn that there's more uh, capability behind enki oh uh well i think the the way to do that is to is to consult the the enki portal um, and to uh, uh, keep looking at the mm -hmm. documentation for the repository on GitLab. And as we develop, uh, as we develop the Enki server more and more, uh, what we will do is we will have a, a facility for announcements of capabilities and so on and so forth that is, that is much more transparent than we have now. So uh, I think we're going to make every effort to uh, to make these, um, to, to make these, uh, the tools that, that the Yankee is trying to implement as, as, as transparent and obvious as possible. And as we develop the calibration software, 
we are going to have um, many more uh, workshops that, um, that teach people uh, and introduce people to, the, to how uh, the software can be used in Enki. In fact, I plan as part of the, um, as part of my EPC funding for the next two years, which was just approved, I have uh, two uh, workshops uh, in the first year and the second year that will be uh, uh, funded and will be uh, put together to deal with introducing the EPC uh, community to uh, the That's capabilities. Great. And, and the engagement team will work with you to efforts. help publicize those as well. Two more um, from Craig Shipries, terrific webinar. Thank you. That's fantastic. <laughs> and Andrea oh, Johnson Mangum says, a DCO legacy in the works, exclamation point. Thanks. <laughs> That's very, very kind, and, and I, I hope that it is actually, because if the, um, uh, well, I mean, not if, when, when the Yankee project comes to a, a, a sort of a full fruition, um, it will be a unique resource. There is nothing like it. There's nothing like it even in the uh, chemical engineering or the chemistry community, um, and certainly nothing like it that is completely open source, which I think is very, very important. Um, there are private, obviously pieces of software that that material science uses, for example, to do similar kinds of things, but uh, nothing completely available mm -hmm. like this. And I think that's really- I've been remiss in introducing myself to those who don't know me. Um, I'm darling through Kristen. I'm the manager of the Synthesis Group 2019, and we are simply delighted that Mark and Dimitri and his colleagues have created this wonderful tool. So thank you from us as well. But I have a little bit, if no one else has any other questions, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do oh, with the you. back end of the webinar. Um, <laughs> for those who have joined, um, the webinar will be up on YouTube shortly, so please share it with your colleagues, and it will be permanently archived, so it's really a resource that is available to the DCO wider community. And I also wanted everyone to know that we have another Jupyter Notebook, uh, seminar planned for August 9th. So please mark your calendars. It's August 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And Fei Fei Penn of DCO's data science team will use the Jupyter Notebook applying um, DCO related data. She's going to teach us how to make this really cool vis visualization of basalt rock volcanoes in Western Europe. And she's using the Python code as well. So Jupyter Notebooks is this amazing tool that DCO is really seized upon. And it should be really interesting to see um, DCO data integrated into Jupyter Notebooks in yet another way. So with that, thank you again, Mark. It was simply delightful and informative. And we hope to see you all next month. And so signing off and stay in touch. Thanks.